In the late 1980s, something strange started happening in the horror genre. A new subgenre began to emerge, one that blended a sleazy porn style aesthetic with 80 slasher levels of gore and violence. But these movies weren't niche or grindhouse, they were made by mainstream Hollywood studios starring respected A-list actors. While horror franchises were beginning to run themselves into the ground, cinema audiences were instead treated to movies like Basic Instinct and Fatal Attraction, films with plenty of Hollywood gloss and sheen despite being filled to the brim with sizzling sex and blood splattery gore. <sighs> Join me as we continue exploring the mind and body, and we look at the late 80s and early 90s boom of the erotic thriller. I'm not going to be ignored, Dan. Welcome back to the evolution of horror. My name is Mike, and as ever, I am your host. If you're tuning in for the first time, then welcome. In this podcast, we explore and dissect the history and the evolution of the horror genre by looking at particular subgenres one series at a time. We are currently in the middle of our sixth series, which explores both psychological and body horror, aka the horror of the mind and the body. And this week, we're bringing you a very special episode. No deep dive discussions on any particular films, just a little closer look at a really interesting movement that occurred around the late 80s, early 90s, now known as the erotic thriller. So this will be a little history lesson and also a kind of a series of short discussions and reviews and recommendations of some of the best and most iconic erotic thrillers from this era, including Fatal Attraction, Basic Instinct, Indecent Proposal, The Last Seduction, and of course, Showgirls. We're going to be talking a little bit about the origin of the erotic thriller, how you define an erotic thriller, and what's happened to the erotic thriller in 2020? Is it dead and gone? Before we get started, I'll just say mild spoiler alert for some of these films like Fatal Attraction and Basic Instinct. We do talk about a few plot points and plot elements and some key scenes from this film, but nothing that would ever ruin the experience of watching them. So much to discuss, let's get started. Joining me to discuss all things erotic thrillers, I've got a very exciting new guest joining me. She is a writer, she's a commissioner, a director, a producer, a journalist, she does a whole bunch of fascinating stuff and perhaps most crucially she is also my boss uh, it is my great pleasure to welcome to the podcast Catherine Bray hello hi I don't think of myself as your boss but then that's the, the kind of thing that bosses say isn't it <laughs> exactly <laughs> think of me exactly. as an entertainer <laughs> that's it much more of a friend and an entertainer than a boss of course uh, so Catherine first of all just tell us a little bit about yourself who you are what you do uh, I'm a very lucky person who gets to do lots of different kinds of things There's I started as a film critic on a magazine called Hot Dog, which was a cult movie mag um, back in the day, uh, a longer ago day than I really re like care to recall these days. But yeah, that was around in 2004, five, six. Um, it was kind of pitched as like a sort of film magazine version of Loaded. Oh, amazing. <laughs> Love it. Yeah, so that was a lot of fun. And then since then, I've done things like commissioning short films for Channel 4 for their Random Act strand. Um, pitched to the BBC and then now run Inside Cinema there together with uh, Michael Leader and yourself, uh, their short video essay strand, short films taking you to the heart of the movies. Love it, love uh, it. And then I also, um, I've made a long form video essay called Guilt Free Pleasures that's going out soon on BBC4. That's an hour long deep dive, so kind of celebrating the sort of movies that traditionally can't get no respect from critics. I love it. Well, that's so good, isn't it? And and I love that title, Guilt Free Pleasures as well, because guilty pleasures, it's not really a thing, is it? I mean, I feel like people don't really like that term guilty pleasures anymore. I think it ties into lots of fairly sort of out dated notions around pleasure being a sin yeah it's this almost calvinist thing of like if we're enjoying a 
comedy or a nude scene that there needs to be some lesson there that you're learning I mean really does there (laughs) exactly exactly yeah and I think that's obviously that's gonna link in quite nicely to what we're about to talk about today but also the horror genre I imagine there must have been quite a lot of horror films on your guilt-free pleasures list right I mean what's your own relationship and history with the horror genre are you a fan oh yeah um my relationship with horror is a loving long-term one uh-huh. <laughs> we're very happy together uh, <laughs> i mean it's not it's not exclusive me and horror i do see other genres on the side but <laughs> yeah uh horror is one of my absolute faves um i guess i mean it goes back probably to pre me being into horror movies i my first encounters with horror would actually be books and, mm-hmm. you know, books are fabulously unregulated. I, I read Jaws, uh, Peter Benchley's novel, which obviously got turned into the film by Steven Spielberg when I was about eight and oh, <laughs> did wow. not understand the sex scenes uh, in the book. <laughs> Ellen Brody, the chief's wife, has a sizzling affair with Hooper. Um, and there's all of this stuff about erections and vaginas that I just like washed over my head. But the stuff with the big scary shark smashing bones and organs into a jelly and its mighty jaws. I mean, that you can understand at that age. And I got a real kick out of it. And you're also traumatized, obviously, by the idea of going swimming for a long time after. But of course. that's probably one of my first encounters with horror, the, the big fish himself. Oh, I love it. I love it. Are you one of those people? There are a lot of people that would not consider Jaws a horror film. I've heard a lot of people make that argument. Would you, would you consider Jaws a horror film? It's borderline, but I think when you've got moments like the floating head in the tank, yeah. like a real jump scare there, it's it's a corpse in the dark. I mean, that's a horror moment, even if you don't find Jaws to be horror. And I think if you write off Jaws, you've got to write off a lot of kind of the more like the social horrors, your Stepford Wives. And that's a bit of the genre that I love. So yeah. I'm, I'm keeping Jaws. I'm going to say Jaws is a horror. Yeah, me too. Absolutely. Although I am famous for saying absolutely everything is a horror. But there you go. Jaws definitely is. Um, <laughs> do, what do you think, um, you know, in terms of sort of what's your favourite um, sort of subgenre, I suppose? You know, uh, on this podcast, we've looked at things like slashers, ghost stories, folk horror, zombie movies, all those different uh, areas of the genre because it's so broad. Do you have a favourite, a favourite subgenre? I guess we just touched on social horror, which mm. I adore your Rosemary's Babies and your, your Stepford Wives your Get Out uh, I yeah. rewatched Texas Chainsaw Massacre the other weekend and I was like actually this is kind of a social horror for vegetarianism which yeah. I had never clocked before but um, it's something I've been thinking about lately so yeah when the cook starts talking about how <laughs> you know we don't want to cause them more pain than necessary but it's important that we have the meat I'm like yes. oh yeah okay that's what this is <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. There's a lot going on in that film, actually, yeah. But then also body horror. Body horror is a big one for me. That's really interesting. And body horror is a genre that uh, I think divides quite a lot of horror fans. I've spoken to quite a few horror fans on this podcast that are sort of uh, that sort of say, no, I can't really handle body horror. And I myself am pretty squeamish with a lot of Cronenberg's films. Oh, Some yeah. of that really kind of squishy small relatable horror you know i rewatched snowtown last weekend and we were watching that through our fingers because although that's not a particularly gory film and you know arguably not a horror Mm -hmm. those scenes with like the fingernails coming off um just gruesome and i think it's because it allows you to just feel like you're watching a drama you're watching real people whereas horror protects you in a way by establishing quite a kind of lurid world sometimes so you almost don't feel like you're watching people being chopped apart it's, yes. it's, a, it's a whole other thing exactly yeah that's cho- that's so true and i think um we've been looking at uh, this series of episodes about sort of horror of the body body horror and also horror of the mind and i guess what you'd call psychological horror and i think there's something quite interesting where particularly maybe at this point in time that we're going to be talking about the sort of late 80s, it starts to bleed into what a lot of people then called the psychological thriller. Um, And there's that very strange, blurry line, and it's a really difficult thing to define. But do you think there is a difference between thriller and horror? And if so, what is it? Or is thriller just a snobby way of avoiding the term horror, you know, to make it sound more prestigious? I'm sure it's been used that way. Mm. Uh, But I think... With thrillers, with your sort of, let's say, uh, something like The Silence of the Lambs, Mm -hmm. there's a detective story there as well. There's a mystery that needs to be solved. And with horror, I don't think that there has to be a mystery. It can be quite often that you you know 
at the beginning that the killer is Michael Myers and he's on the loose and yeah. you know really it's that idea of this this is ultimate evil and it's coming for you you don't really need to know what the rationale for the evil is and you're not really interested in seeing the police catch him it's not about that whereas something like Silence of the Lambs you absolutely want to see Clarice crack the case yeah no that's so true isn't it I suppose you're not just watching it to be terrified there's 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 other stuff uh going on in a lot of these and you could strip out the horror elements of Silence of the Lambs like you could uh have Hannibal Lecter instead of being a serial killer in a cell be like a friendly avuncular gentleman who's retired from his police career and is helping her out with the clues I mean it would be a different movie but structurally it would still work yeah absolutely why do you think this happened this weird little bubble of movies in the late 80s and early 90s particularly where suddenly we were getting thrillers high-end thrillers with all of these sort of Oscar-winning performances, whether it's Kathy Bates in Misery or Anthony Hopkins in Silence of the Lambs. You know, how did this suddenly happen, uh, you know, at this time, do you think? I don't know. Is it something about it sort of all being sort of slightly closer to home? Because you see it in action movies as well. Like Die Hard is not a pumped-up muscle guy who's definitely going to get the terrorists. It's just this exhausted... Bruce Willis figure in his vest. Um, I wonder whether it was about bringing it all back down to earth a bit more. These these horror movies are not generally supernatural. They're they're horror they're horror in the home by and large. Your misery. He's trapped in her house. Fatal Attraction is a domestic horror thriller. Um, these things tend to go in cycles. So maybe it's a sort of reaction against uh, the 80s slasher movie moving more and more into that area of Jason being sort of almost supernatural and you know, Michael Myers being unkillable. I think maybe it's a sort of a reset to bring things not back down to earth exactly, because I don't think we'd describe these movies as down to earth films. They're not social realist horror, but maybe it's a little bit of a reaction against that. I think it I think it definitely is and I think also what it does is lend a kind of psychological uh, medical uh, perspective maybe to some of these you know crazy killers um, that you might see in slasher films you know when you look at books by people like Thomas Harris in the 80s and uh, you know movies and books and fiction that sort of delves into the mind of a serial killer and the inner workings of it that somehow makes it all feel a little bit more clever and academic and therefore a bit more prestigious and I think also uh, you know these famous actors get to play quote unquote crazy people and it gives them a chance to really go for it with big performances right uh, again, Kathy Bates, Anthony Hopkins, even Glenn Close in Fatal Attraction. You've got these sort of show-stopping performances and all of a sudden they're not labelled horror anymore. They're labelled kind of high-end, gruesome thrillers. Yeah, and that's probably another reaction. People maybe got a little bit bored of seeing all of these sort of disposable, interchangeable teenagers mm. or, you know, 30-year-olds playing teenagers it, they're all they're sort of grist to the serial killer's mill and the villain becomes more important whereas in these films you've got someone like Michael Douglas who's a recognizable actor you kind of feel like surely he's not going to get killed and you know that it's going to play out in a different way it's not like seven teenagers going to stay in a cabin in the woods it's unpredictable I mean we whenever you get to a point where people are tired of a formula someone will go another way and, and change the formula or establish a new formula. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, exactly that. So speaking of Michael Douglas, then let's talk about this other thing that was going on at this time and which people now generally label the erotic thriller, right? Um, let me just start with the basics, Catherine. First of all, what is an erotic thriller? How would you sort of define it? Well, Mike... Uh, when two <laughs> protagonists love each other very much, sometimes they decide to express that love physically. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I guess sex scenes are part of it, but the difference between the sex scenes in the erotic thriller uh, and the sex scenes in the sort of, you know, higher numbers of a Friday the 13th style franchise are, but it's both the fame of the people involved generally um, and mm -hmm. I think there's also the fact that actually in an erotic thriller, you're not normally disturbed by the maniac halfway through. Usually the sex scenes are there to be sexy and uh, achieve completion. Uh, not necessarily. Obviously, you've got exceptions. Basic Instinct, notably the opening scene of that. 
but the sex scenes generally aren't sort of the site of the killing as much. They're they're sort of there as more of a fantasy. Interesting. So basically lots of sex, lots of death, essentially. Yes, but not necessarily in the same scene. <laughs> not at the same time. I love it. Because um, again, you know, there is, a, there is quite a... Um, I think there's an interesting link, isn't there, between slasher horror and these, uh, especially when you look at something like the opening scene of Basic Instinct. But yeah, there is something about the classic slasher that is a little bit more conservative in some ways in terms of the way it treats sex, right? I mean, obviously, really classically, like every you know character comments on in Scream, if you have sex or if you misbehave, you're usually punished for it. The virgin usually survives, etc. The The rules, I suppose are a little bit different in these types of thrillers I suppose aren't they in some ways a bit more a bit more mature I guess than your traditional slasher yeah I, I, the, they don't have that kind of like Jason thing of like Jason hates sex and if you're doing it he will run in and end you um, yeah <laughs> It's not so much that, but they do probably have, as you were saying, more in common with slasher films than like other types of horror. I mean, they tend not to be super gothic. They tend not to be supernatural. Um, They're not, you know, monsters Mm -hmm. or overlapping with sci-fi. The erotic thriller is sort of if the teenagers of a traditional slasher film had actually survived and grown up and gone on to become yuppies with a family. It's like, that's the sort of vibe. <laughs> yeah. I think they're also quite aspirational. Like they often take place in these glossy homes that are quite nice to inhabit. Um, sometimes they leave the horror aspect out and, you know, you get your indecent proposals, films like that, where it's about the sort of the glamour of the high rolling lifestyle. I think there's quite a bit of that in them as well. That's, that's quite a lot of fun. And that sort of ties into this idea of the souring of the 80s greed is good era. It's like, instead of sex being the thing that they're punished for, maybe money is the thing that they're being punished for. Yeah, and actually, I was gonna, and we'll, we'll we'll get to this in a bit about sort of how the the, the decline of this little subgenre, I suppose, in the mid nineties. But did, did is the, it was it very important the time, I suppose, of when these happened, i.e., the late eighties, the result of whatever you might, you know, greed, Reaganism, all of that. Is that all sort of tied in to how these films happened? Do you think? Yeah, maybe there's a bit of anxiety about the idea of having it all. I mean, look at Michael Douglas's character in Fatal Attraction. He's got the loving wife and the beautiful home. And then he also wants to have the exciting sex with the glamorous stranger. And the glamorous stranger, by the way, is the woman who's uh, sort of trying to have it all, have the career. And supposedly she's sort of anxious about the idea that she's never going to have kids. So there... I think there are a lot of these um, 80s anxieties around what we're meant to want from life. So let's talk about, speaking of fatal attraction, let me try and start at the beginning um, and let's talk about how the sort of boom of the erotic thriller began. Now, you made a really brilliant video essay about this, about the sort of rise and fall of the erotic thriller for Inside Cinema, which people can now still check out on BBC iPlayer. Um, And the first film that you cite, the movie that you kind of say is responsible for this boom is Fatal Attraction. Um, So is that right? Is fatal attraction the reason that this little subgenre exists the people who went to see fatal attraction in their millions yes those are the yeah. people responsible i mean if it hadn't done as well as it did i don't think we would have had this cycle but it made i mean we say in the essay which you mention and um, very modestly omit to mention that you edited together i mean you're the other voice in that one it's a fantastically edited piece um I think it's over 300 million it took at the box office Incredible. on a budget of like 14 million, something like yeah. that. Uh, just an incredible ratio. Whenever you see that ratio in film, there's going to be more of whatever was responsible. I think you see it with like Blumhouse Horror. They've got that incredible model of spending five, 10 million, whatever it is on a film and then just making enormous bank. Like why wouldn't you as a business repeat that Mm. not to be too you know (laughs) hollywood is an industry about things yeah you're absolutely right um it's an incredible thing it's an incredible success isn't it this film let's talk a little bit about this then just spend a few minutes on this movie it's such an interesting movie in so many ways it is a horror film um but also as you mentioned so much responsible for this little movement this little boom uh adrian lyon's fatal attraction from 1987 a look that led to an evening. We were attracted to each other at the party, that was obvious. 
You're on your own for the night. That's also obvious. A mistake he'd regret all his life. Now, where's your wife? Fatal Attraction. So obviously, we're not going to spoil this. We're not going to talk about it in depth. But I'm sure most people out there know the basic gist of Fatal Attraction. This was directed by Adrian Lyne, stars Michael Douglas, and of course, Glenn Close. Michael Douglas plays Dan Gallagher, who uh, has an extramarital affair while his wife and child are away. He sleeps with Alex Forrest, played by Glenn Close. And then Alex Forrest won't leave him alone. And of course, we have infamous uh, scenes that follow throughout the movie. Uh, Catherine, first of all, let me ask you, what are your thoughts of Fatal Attraction? Are you a fan of this film? I, I like it fine. It's not my favourite, um, but I, I adore it for kicking off the cycle and obviously introduce Bunny Boiler into the lexicon. You've got to take your hat off to anything that sort of invents a part of the language that has you know that extends beyond the film itself i'm sure there's people using the term bunny boiler who have never seen an archer raise the lid on on a pet rabbit that's that's bubbling away there on the stove thanks to glenn close's jealous maniac <laughs> Daddy! what And this is where the, the the fine line between all these different genres is so fascinating to me, I think. Because when you take that bunny boiler scene in isolation, you know, okay, so much of this film isn't a horror. It's this kind of yuppie drama, right? But but that scene, the way that that bunny boiling scene is cut together um, with the child kind of running and the mother kind of opening the pot and it's cutting between them in montage. It almost looks like something from Nick Rogue's Don't Look Now or something in the way that it's cut together uh, and builds that suspense. And, you know, I think, you know, they're, they're clearly using very obvious horror tropes in this film. And, you know, we should talk about the ending in a minute as well. There's so much to discuss in this film, but let me start off by asking you about Michael Douglas, because I feel like we're going to talk about Michael Douglas again and again here. Um, what was it about Michael Douglas that made him so perfect for this kind of film, for the erotic thriller? I think it helps that he was cast in Fatal Attraction, and again, it's like about repeating the formula. But you think about who else was about at that time, like who are the other major stars? I mean, you're not going to get Schwarzenegger in this role. There's going to be no doubt that he's going to succeed and best this woman who's after his family. Um, I mean, I don't know who else. Michael Keaton. I don't want to see him fuck. Like, no, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Michael Douglas, he's, he's got that sort of very peculiar mixture of he's good looking enough, but he's not... I mean, so Johnny Depp's probably in his late 20s at this time and he's too pretty for this kind of a role. Mm. The guy's got to be believable as an everyman. He's got to feel a little bit lived in. And at the same time, he's got to feel alpha enough that you buy him as this sort of semi-beta hero. I think it's quite a kind of complex mixture. You don't want to see Robert De Niro in this role. It's uh, it's quite a particular yeah. kind of mixture. I think it's to do with how fragile masculinity is in a way, when you step back from it, there's that famous quote about, you know, women are afraid men will kill them, men are afraid women will laugh at them. And a lot of focus goes into the half where women are afraid of men killing them, naturally enough. But think about the other half of that, the idea of masculinity as this sort of slightly kind of frail, can be deflated almost immediately sort of concept and I think Michael Douglas plays that very well he's very good at playing that sort of frazzled guy on the edge yeah you're right and if, like you said just it's just the right balance of kind of he's he's charismatic but also sleazy as hell isn't he I mean there's something really unlikable about him in most of these films you know as well as something very kind of yeah uh, intriguing about him you're so right you're so right I was trying to think why Costner wouldn't work in these roles because he's a big star at this time as well. But actually, there's a wholesomeness to Kevin Costner. Yeah. 
Um, I think maybe yeah. Bill Pullman could have pulled this off as well. Like, if you'd cast Bill Pullman in Fatal Attraction, then he would be the guy that people were trying to get back for Basic Instinct later in the cycle and all of these other ones. <laughs> yeah, you're so um, right. Yeah, you're so right. What about then this idea of the quote unquote crazy woman in, in Fatal Attraction as well? <laughs> I mean, how do you feel the way that, you know, these films obviously do have a bit of a sleazy gays right don't they most of them are on their stars also though the women get to play quite interesting roles right they get to play these kind of villains that are so often played by men so i just wondered what are your thoughts on this on the on the portrayal of women in the erotic thriller fatal attraction is a very weird one in these terms because actually i don't think the camera sort of you know adores glenn close the way that someone like sharon stone would later be the sort of focus of this intense level of sort of sexual desire and something like basic instinct um, i think glenn close is extremely interesting casting in this role because you can certainly imagine them getting someone who's more sort of like I'm not saying anything bad about Glenn Close, but more kind of conventionally feminine and uh, more vulnerable. Like she's got this incredible bone structure. She's got this amazing like 80s power hair. She looks like she could punch you out. Like there's a real force there. And I think maybe it, is, it plays into that sort of terror, that idea of like women are working in Wall Street now. Uh, women can have anything that men have, but do they still want babies? And are they going to uh, come after us and take those babies violently? I think there's like those sort of anxieties are in fatal attraction. I mean, I think this is why it's more interesting when art reflects the prejudices of its own era than, than tries to be always progressive. Like you could make a film in the 80s that was sort of much more, you know, less open to charges of misogyny, but that wouldn't be an accurate reflection of the 80s. Don't you think I understand what you're doing? You're trying to move him, move him into the country and you're keeping him away from me. And you're playing happy family. But you wouldn't understand that because you're so selfish. Because <laughs> he told me about you. If you weren't so stupid, you'd know that, but you're so stupid. You're just so stupid. You're a stupid, selfish bitch. <laughs> And I think ultimately the film is commenting on the misogyny, right? Again, that brings back that idea of Michael Douglas isn't really a hero in this, is he? I mean, I know that audiences at the time absolutely hated Alex Glenn Close's character and wanted her to die and did find themselves siding with Michael Douglas, which is a problem maybe, but... You know, ultimately, this film doesn't paint him in a good light, really. And, you know, I, I find that kind of dynamic in these films quite interesting because even when you, even when it comes to the nudity, right? I mean, it's something you mentioned again in your essay that there is a little bit more uh, equal footing, so to speak, when it comes to nudity. You do get just as much uh, of a, a kind of leery gaze on the male body as you do on the female one, right? Yeah, I mean, the 80s slashes, you're going to get tits you're gonna get like a lot of nudity and even before the nudity you'll get sort of uh figure hugging skimpy hot pants type outfits from the female characters and the men they rarely disrobe and when they do they'll be killed in like the next five seconds uh and then in these films you do get more more male flesh on display not to the extent of what you're seeing from the women because hello it's still america and they're terrified of penises but <laughs> it, there, there is a little bit more for the um, the lusty eye for the male guy. <laughs> yeah, do you think, um, to be very reductive about it, do you think these movies were aimed at a female audience as much as they were for a male audience? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I It feels like they're very sort of date night movies for married couples or new couples they it's that very much that idea if you go and see this with your wife and have an interesting conversation afterwards and maybe you're a bit turned on at the same time i think it's it's <laughs> that it's the same it's probably the audience for uh high quality box sets now i mean now you <laughs> yeah. don't have to leave your house but it's that <laughs> it's the same vibe exactly i mean i remember god i i was introduced to these films uh, they blew my mind as a kid when they were on they were always on sort of late 
on Channel 5, do you remember? Sort of Friday nights at around 10 o'clock. That was when I, uh, <laughs> that was when my eyes were really opened to this whole little magical subgenre. Um, but it is, it, like you said, it's a really interesting amount of uh, kind of being entertained, being turned on, and also being genuinely scared by it. I mean, what about that incredible final sequence of Fatal Attraction when, again, it goes full slasher horror, it feels like, right? I mean, there is that um, that sort of attack in the bathroom. And I know famously, originally, um, the character of Alex was supposed to sort of cut her wrists and kill herself. And he was maybe going to get the blame for it, I think. And she was sort of going to get her revenge that way. And test audiences absolutely hated that, right? They thought that she didn't get punished as much as she should. And they then changed it for this very kind of over the top ending with loads of blood and violence and a big jump scare yes it's easy to picture a horror audience um kind of almost cheering on freddy like yeah yeah get her freddy uh yeah uh, and if you watch a fatal attraction or any of its kind of um later descendants it's very much on the side of the wronged wife yes get her an archer yes. yes get her beyonce and in, in obsessed which is a kind of a later riff on the same themes when was the last time you spoke to her it's been a few weeks gran mom She called me a few weeks ago. I think she was scared. She thought someone was coming into the house. Hello, everybody. That was a little clip you just heard there from the one and only Relic. That was a October release that got quite a lot of buzz, a new horror film starring Emily Mortimer. Now, that's a little snippet of what we've got going on over on Patreon this week. There was so much great stuff that came out across the month of October. Now, some of which we covered on our main feed, including His House, probably my favourite film of the year, and The Haunting of Bly Manor. But there was a whole bunch of other stuff as well. Uh, to name a few, we had The Craft Legacy, uh, we had Shirley, and we had movies that premiered at London Film Festival like Possessor. So, over on Patreon this week, I was joined by a whole bunch of guests, EOH faves, to discuss some of these movies. Here's a little snippet of what they thought. Did you have high expectations before going to see this film? No. <laughs> <laughs> I think it didn't work because it's it's very, very limp. Like, it has no bite. It's got nothing really to say. I loved it. Absolutely yeah. loved it. So claustrophobic. Like, it's sort of set in this very, like, sultry, sticky summer. They're always moaning about the fact that they're too hot and everybody's sort of sweating all over each other and, you know, sort of peeling their clothes off the whole time. I really didn't expect sort of possessed trousers that kill people to be my one of my favourite horror movies of the festival, but it was. It was this brilliant, societally sharp commentary, piece of commentary that was horrific and funny and smart. It feels so heavy handed and clunky uh, that it just constantly hits you over the head with the same kind of metaphorical allegories for loss and time and memory and things along those lines. That it just feels like, all right, we get it. Like, come on, like, I understand what you're getting at. Let's maybe have a bit more subtlety and a bit more nuance to it. Uh, because if there's one thing the film doesn't want you to forget, it's that it's about forgetting. <laughs> And there we go. If you want to hear more of those discussions, you simply need to sign up to our Patreon and sign up on a $5 level. Patreon.com slash Evolution of Horror. If you sign up and donate $5 per month, you will get treated to regular bonus episodes such as these. And if you want to sign up for a $10 level, you will get additional content, including access to our exclusive mini seasons. Patreon.com slash Evolution of Horror. Everybody who signs up from the UK will get sent an Evolution of Horror 
a sticker and you'll all get a very special shout out on the podcast as a thank you. Speaking of, I'm going to give everybody a very special thanks who signed up in the last few weeks. So a big thanks to Hannah Nixon, Tice Bergman, Matt Morrow, Scarlett, John G, Tobin Steers, Laura Riley, Harry Mayer, Marion Hilditch, Natalie Bulmer, Jenny Needham, Roberto Alberta, Zach, Danny C, Kevin Grigg, Michelle Foy, Tom Evans, Mark Hollands, Jess Reese, Kai, Thomas Hewitt, Holly S, Caitlin Stodola, Ashlyn Kelly, Alex Hornsby, Andrew Benker, George Leake, Tom Harrison, Scott Mund, Kevin Ibbotson Wright, Absolution, Jason Neiman, Craig Boakley, Jackie Monison, Alistair Crowley, Chris Pembury, Dave Stockdale, Richard Bland, Kathy Mackle, and Tammy Anderson. A huge thank you to all of those people. And one more time, if you want to sign up to our Patreon and get treated to weekly bonus content and more sign up now patreon.com slash evolution of horror that's patreon.com slash evolution of horror okay let's return to mine and Catherine's discussion of erotic thrillers following fatal attraction like you say w- made absolutely millions we then had this little little boom of erotic thrillers absolutely loads and we'll talk about a couple of the biggies in a minute but you know so many just to list a few single white female sleeping with the enemy indecent proposal bod- body of evidence disclosure the last seduction etc and then in these films this incredible lineup of stars in all of them right i mean again i'm quoting your inside cinema essay here where you brilliantly kind of reel them all off but people like sharon stone woody Harris. Demi Moore, Linda Fiorentino, Robert Redford, Gene Triplehorn, Burt Reynolds, and of course, Michael Douglas. There's so many interesting people in all of these interesting films, all of them kind of released in the space of a few years following Fatal Attraction. Um, again, very similar to what we saw with the slasher boom in the early 80s. Uh, Catherine, any particular favourite out of this glut of movies that we got around this time? Any highlights for you? The Last Seduction is absolutely the one for me. Um, that's a genuinely, genuinely good movie. Linda Fiorentino is Bridget, and Bridget is bad. Bad to the bone. You have your own place? Yes. Is it a sty? No, it's clean. Do you have indoor plumbing? Bill Pullman is her loving husband, Clay. Bridget! And he wishes he never met her. She stole a fortune from me after making me steal it. But she's not willing to give it up. It's mine, you hit me. Hey! Can he afford a good lawyer? (laughs) Anybody checked you for a heartbeat lately? Linda Fiorentino, Peter Berg, Bill Pullman. You better run! The Last Seduction. In a town called Beston, there is a woman who can't control her unnatural instincts. I picked you some cookies. It's got at least as much in common with kind of 40s and 50s film noir as it has with slasher films. It's much more in that kind of lineage of the femme fatale who's just totally one step ahead of all of the dudes at all times. I mean, anyone who wants to write this whole genre off as misogynistic, like have a look at that film. Like she's a villain, but she's complex and she's fabulous. And yeah, I would go to bat for Bridget Gregory uh, as a character played by Linda Florentino is like one of the great Oscar misses of all time because I don't think they were allowed to submit her performance because the film had aired on TV too soon. But if, yeah, it's the sort of film where you kind of, you almost want to see it remade to see what sort of someone, I don't know, like a Isabel Huppert maybe, like if you wanted mm. to cast it a little older. Like it's a film that really didn't get widely enough seen at the time and should be watched by more people today. Oh, very cool. Yeah, I haven't seen it in absolutely... I think that was one of those that I caught, you know, very young on Channel 5. I need to give it another watch. Linda Fiorentino, what, what's happened to her as well? Because again, I really kind of, a little bit more like Michael Douglas, I suppose, kind of very much associate her with this era and these films. She's kind of disappeared now, hasn't she? I think it's a shame that when women do the sex scenes in these films, people kind of maybe remember that as what was good about their performance. And then when mm. they get older for you know various hollywood misogyny and ageism type reasons people go well i don't want to see her have sex anymore and therefore there are no roles for her it's it's that kind of thing i think i mean tv has been quite good in this in this sort of arena of picking actresses who 
were kind of famous for being sexy in their 20s and 30s and actually giving really interesting meaty roles to them now i'm thinking of like julia ormond in mad men or um mm. oh god who what's the name of the woman that don has an affair with in season seven anyway yeah so tv to the rescue but yeah i guess it's to do with that idea of the sexual impact of their roles being so overwhelming people forgot that they were also actually just like damn fine performances sex excluded yes i mean the last seduction is a great example as well of um people sort of i think think of the sex scenes in these movies sometimes as gratuitous and they're really not because you need to see how good the sex is to understand how all of these men end up kind of in her web her, the puppets dancing her tune if you couldn't see how like fucking hot and incredible these scenes are you'd be like well why are they doing that she, clearly she's a villain why are they um but you, yeah i think you've got to see the incentive and in the case of a lot of these films the incentive is sex so yeah yeah you're absolutely right and i think you know that is important it's such an important element uh, of these films these sex scenes have got to be hot they've got to be lit well they've got to be they have that kind of porny soft focus aesthetic you know that kind of score all of that is really important and all of this i think brings us nicely to one of the big movies from this era that I've, that i've got to ask you about Paul Verhoeven's Basic Instinct. I like men like that. Men who give me pleasure. He gave me a lot of pleasure. You ever uh, engage in any sadomasochistic activity? Exactly what did you have in mind, Mr. Corelli? You ever tie him up? No. You never tied him up? No. Johnny liked to use his hands too much. I like hands and fingers. Do you use drugs, Mr. Mill? Sometimes. You ever use drugs with Mr. Boz? Sure. What kind of drugs? Cocaine. Have you ever fucked on cocaine, Nick? nice now this goes back exactly to what you were just saying i think about how some of these actresses were so unfairly kind of dismissed as being just these kind of uh, sexy supporting stars in these films right and sharon stone <laughs> yes is incredibly sexy but i i always forget until i re-watch this film every time just how good an actress she is i mean she is She's so mesmerising on screen. For me, this film wouldn't work at all without Sharon Stone. Uh, but what do you think of Basic Instinct? I completely agree on Sharon Stone. It's it's such a fabulous performance. It's it's like this close to high camp, but Dan's yeah. just the right side of it. Uh, it. You know, it's a fabulous role for a drag queen because you don't need to amp it up by much to land in that territory. But I think she, you know, she really nails it because it's a sort of fairly fundamentally ludicrous script. It's like watching Vertigo through this funhouse mirror. Um, yeah. It's, you know, <laughs> weird metaphor coming up. You know, in LA Confidential, there mm -hmm. are the sex workers who have had plastic surgery and been costumed to look like classic 40s Hollywood stars. Yes. Uh, like Veronica Lake or whoever. I feel like Basic Instinct is that to Vertigo. It's the same relationship. It's like the sort of almost over-the-top costume, cosmetic surgery version of Vertigo um, <laughs> that's there for more explicit sex and good times. How do you find, are you personally a fan of Basic Instinct? Does it kind of add any, does Paul Verhoeven come and add anything to this little subgenre that kind of fatal attraction, I suppose, sort of introduced in any way? You know, because it feels like in some ways Basic Instinct was the next big milestone, I suppose, in this little era. Yeah, Basic Instinct is more trashy and mm -hmm. it's fairly unashamedly trashy it's uh it's the epitome of this sort of sexy thrillers sex scene like everything is kind of perfect choreographed to win it within an inch of its life it's a, almost a very music video aesthetic yeah everybody is golden there's no blemishes you're not going to see like a spot on somebody's bum it's all been airbrushed out um and 
I think there's a pleasure to those worlds. They, there's a kind of a campness and a kitschness there, but in Basic Instinct, it's sort of slightly dialed down compared to where it would later go. And I do think just Sharon Stone, her look in that film is so incredible. They borrowed a lot of inspiration from Kim Novak's outfits in Vertigo. I think even maybe the colour sequence matches as you go through the film, something like that. Yeah. But yeah, that there's something about a blonde with legs dressed in white that just does something to me. Uh, <laughs> you know, Hitchcock, Hitchcock talked more perversely about this than I think I should on a podcast, but I think it's a... <laughs> There's a real erotic archetype there that Basic Instinct just nails. Yeah, you're you're so right. And and ag- again, th- they've up, you know compared to Fatal Attraction, for example, it really ups the violence in a big way. I mean that. I mean I remember this because of us making this video essay together. At how much I had to cut around that there is a lot of really not just explicit sex but nasty violence and stabbing i mean that opening scene it's like wow you know again they they this film was not pulling any punches was it yeah, we had some help making that essay from uh, Jamie Maysner. Shout out Jamie as a junior editor. <laughs> ja- and, brilliant Jamie. Uh, Jamie's a bit, a bit younger than us. And I think, you know, it was the first time he'd seen some of these films. And if you, <laughs> if you are younger, it's, it's very kind of like, what's this stuff doing in the cinema? I thought this belonged on like Pornhub because yeah. movies don't have these kinds of scenes anymore. Um, and also, you know... RIP the days of working in a busy office but having to edit that on a big iMac with people walking past and it looks like you're just cutting together this compilation of sex and kills which which you kind of are it was I mean an enormous amount of fun so much fun even I found that though as well working in an open plan office and editing this video where I was dealing with clips from Basic Instinct and The Last Seduction and some of these other films because you're right it's kind of Porny. It's like genuinely porny. The, the way that these films are shot and lit and scored. And we just, and I think we'll talk about this in a bit maybe, in terms of where this genre is now, but this type of sex scene in mainstream cinema just does not seem to exist anymore, right? And, you know, outside of the actual porn industry. And people will say, oh, but the sex scenes aren't very realistic. Oh, well, like, I mean, good luck, welcome to films. Like, yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. Even exactly. films that are famous for being realistic are often not very realistic. It will be like a, yeah, a film where nobody cracks a smile or makes a stupid joke. I mean, that's that's not realistic. Human beings do that shit mm-hmm. all the time, even in really bleak circumstances. I think there's lots of ways in which we're prepared to allow cinema to be a realis- realistic or not. Um, and I don't know whether f- sort of, I mean, you want a full range of experiences to be depicted. Obviously, you want realistic sex scenes sometimes, and you also want these kind of campy, Vaseline on the lens, golden hour, million dollar sex scene, sex scenes as well, I think. It's all part of God's rich tapestry. Absolutely, I agree. Um, so off the back of Basic Instinct, these films continued as we moved into the early 90s, more and more of these high-end erotic thrillers. Some of them a little bit more erotic than they were thriller or horror. Uh, one of the biggies from the early 90s that made quite a lot of money was Indecent Proposal. Uh This is from 1993, also directed by Adrian Lyne, uh, post-Fatal Attraction. So this is this really kind of sleazy film, right? With uh, Demi Moore, Robert Redford, Woody Harrelson. Demi Moore and Woody Harrelson are a married couple, but Robert Redford, who meets them, offers them a million dollars if he can spend the whole night with Demi Moore. Uh, Catherine, what did you think of Indecent Proposal? Yeah, I mean, that's a a dumb film, but uh, quite a lot of fun. (laughs) That's (laughs) another one that sort of enters the lexicon I think the fact that a sitcom like Peep Show can reference it 20 25 years later there's an episode of Peep Show where Mark's boss Johnson uh, makes an indecent proposal to Jeremy to sleep with his girlfriend Big Sue's for I think 500 pounds (laughs) something of that order Um, and it's just this ludicrous low rent version of Robert Redford saying to Woody Harrelson I'll give you a million dollars to sleep with your wife I mean, Indecent Proposal, that is probably a film that's indefensible on gender dynamics because the offer is made to the husband rather than to the wife who has to do the, you know, the sex. Admittedly, it's sex with Robert Redford, but still. It's a film where I think it kind of skates by on the aesthetic. Like the the thing that you remember about that film is Demi Moore rolling around on a bed, like (laughs) in a pile of money. (laughs) Yeah. um. I remember even watching it when I was like fairly young. I 
found it very uncomfortable that film in so many ways yeah it's uh but that's true Demi Moore rolling around in money is definitely one of the one of the lasting images from that isn't it um so this wave of erotic mainstream movies continued through the 90s but it had to end somewhere right and I think it's probably safe to say I mean this is another thing you point out in your essay that it all came to a stop in 1995 with one of the most famous movie flops of all time Paul Verhoeven's Showgirls you'll never die. I want to see you dance and I want to see you smile I can't use you if you can't smile I can't use you if you can't show I can't use you if you can't sell from the creators of Basic Instinct the last time they took you to the edge this time they're taking you all the way We take the cash, we cash the check, we show them what they want to see. Catherine, talk to me about Showgirls. What was Showgirls? (laughs) Showgirls took Saved by the Bell star Elizabeth Berkeley and turned her into a star. Um, Yeah, I mean, what a film. It's your classic uh, ingenue comes to make it in the big city narrative, um, I mean, I I sort of hate that formulation where people say it's X on steroids, but it is a star is born on steroids. Um, You know, there's other stuff in the mix there as well, that that sort of narrative. But I think the thing that's really funny about it is that it's not that different from a basic instinct type film. And it's the same pairing of Verhoeven with Joe Esterhaz, and they were paid a lot of money to make this film. Um, And... And it completely flopped. And I think the difference is is they sort of up the camp by like maybe 5%. <laughs> yeah. And it was just enough to make people feel stupid for having felt turned on the first time. So like, <laughs> oh my God. I think, I think it was a lot of that sort of, people almost felt like they'd been tricked by Basic Instinct because it's mm. really fundamentally not that much more ludicrous than Basic Instinct. I mean, the performance yeah. by the... Uh, lead actor you know I think Sharon Stone is better than Elizabeth Berkeley, but it, her performance is so stylized. it's like a stylized version of what you would want this performance to be and I think it made people feel sort of like dumb for having you know included basic instinct in these kinds of conversations about cultural zeitgeist and you know Oscar worthy performances um, so yeah Showgirls is a really fun one and then I think there's this interesting thing that happens with Showgirls where people people talk about it as oh it's a really fun watch apart from the rape scene which is really uh, misguided and I think it's actually that that sort of marks Showgirls out as something a little bit more serious because it's showing you if you could do Showgirls without that scene and it would be saying that like, this Las Vegas world is this really high camp fun thing. Mm. It's kind of ahead of the Me Too movement in that sense, in that he's sort of saying, look, this is what is going on behind closed doors. I mean, the scene literally takes place behind closed doors involving yeah. a celebrity and someone who's working in wardrobe. Um, and there's a glamorous party happening next door at the same time. It's really a kind of a little sort of metatextual whistleblowing. I mean, yes, it disrupts the film if you're watching it and like laughing along. Like it's not uh, fun in the same way as the rest of the film. But I think it it earns its place in there. I don't think it's gratuitous at all. Um, and then and then it does lead to the kind of <laughs> the rape revenge sequence with uh, Nomi Malone and her flick knife going after the guy on behalf of her friend, which is uh, you know back to the tone of the rest of Showgirls and is an enormous <laughs> amount of fun. I know. And also, I mean, you, you mentioned earlier about how these sex scenes need to be good. They need to be sexy. You know, it's again, it's famous, isn't it? Showgirls for that swimming pool sex scene as well. <laughs> One of the silliest or most spoofed or most laughed at sex scenes in the history of cinema possibly as well, isn't it? I think maybe, yeah. And maybe that's because it sort of makes us feel silly about other sex scenes that we've enjoyed. Like, wh- why yeah. is that scene really any sillier than any other ludicrous over-the-top sex scene like it's these ridiculously perfect bodies having a slightly imp- implausible version of sex i mean i say slightly implausible massively implausible version of sex like she's <laughs> thrashing around like she's dying it really reminds me of nothing so much as that opening scene of jo- from jaws where the first swimmer is you know being pulled about in the water by by a monster from the deep i mean it's very much on that level of high drama 
but yeah i i don't know i think it it overshadows slightly the pole dancing scene where she does a similar sort of uh thresher movement her abdominal muscles must be insane and in that one she makes carl mclaughlin come his pants without like actually undressing him it's just all over the trousers <laughs> uh but yeah it's i did want to put that in the new essay film my new hour-long documentary which is coming out soon but uh, it, it ended up being too explicit we had to go kind of, we had to come find something slightly softer and i was like well they're not actually having sex but uh, apparently <laughs> it's just as explicit as as if they were <laughs> I, I was gonna ask you so obviously not to spoil too much but this does make an appearance i assume in guilt-free pleasures yes yeah we've got it in quite an extended sequence from showgirls um it's not all erotic thrillers. We've got Cats. We've got Plan 9 from Outer Space. We've got yes. Xanadu. The Room is in there for a big old chunk. Of course. It's all those kinds of films. All the, all the favourites. And I think you're right about Showgirls. It's also maybe the performances, you know, not to take anything away from these two, but maybe, like you say, Jesse from Saved by the Bell and Agent Cooper from Twin Peaks just aren't as sexy or aren't as good at this as Michael Douglas <laughs> and Sharon Stone were, for example. You know, it's just quite yeah. weird seeing those two do this. <laughs> and really, you know, fair play to Jesse from Saved by the Bell because she went through with the press tour for Showgirls even after the first reviews were out and people were tearing it to shreds. And I think everybody else, certainly Carl McLaughlin, headed for the hills and yeah. you know, did not associate themselves with the film, which... I don't know, like, you, you made it. Uh, I don't yeah. think you can sort of claim that you thought you were making something else. It's it's very much as the script would suggest. Yeah, you're so right. And, yeah, and, and I think what's really interesting now is that it feels like one of those films that is being reassessed. I think there was a really interesting documentary, wasn't there, You Don't Know Me, and that there's been a lot of... I think people are kind of changing their minds about showgirls a little bit now aren't they yeah uh, adam Naiman says this in his book showgirls it doesn't suck but there's so much in there that um can't possibly be there by accident um so you know whether you like it or not this was not an accidental fuck up of a film this wasn't verhoeven trying to make something else and ending up with showgirls it's uh, all very deliberately achieved i mean there's probably not sort of space to recap the whole argument here but have a look at the book He's, he traces this kind of incredibly compelling argument involving mirrors that run throughout the film there's a lot of mirroring between nomi and crystal connor's uh, yeah. incredible performance by gina gersh and i can't believe i haven't mentioned this sooner like she's the real standout <laughs> i think of the film um as the you know, reigning star that nomi needs to dispatch in order to claim her place in the cabaret um yeah i mean adam puts it better than i can and i highly recommend that book but yeah I, it's it's nice that showgirls has been reassessed i think it's possible sometimes to go too far with that idea of oh this film was trashed therefore it must be a masterpiece but yeah. I'll go along yeah. with Some it. Some things are just case. bad. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I, do, I don't think uh, necessarily Elizabeth Berkeley, like I, I, she was coached to give a certain performance, um, whether she was in on the joke or not. I think that's maybe mm. like, the jury's out on that and we, you mentioned earlier when we were talking about the last seduction Isabelle Huppert and and, and uh, I think people started to I heard a lot of conversations about showgirls start to happen again off the back of Paul Verhoeven's L as well and that kind of felt like a little bit of a return to the sort of erotic thriller there didn't it and um, what what did you think of of L? Gosh I loved it but um, that's a film that walks a very fine line um, oh my a very God, fine yeah. line indeed a uh, film in which yeah a woman is uh, sexually assaulted and then goes on to form a relationship with the guy who assaults her or a relationship of sorts I mean that's obviously very difficult territory Verhoeven credited Hooper with a lot of the sort of um, creative authority on that film um, and that makes sense to me because it's one of those films that's built around the character so they build this very complex character um, and then they plausibly follow how she might react in this set of circumstances so you know is it an ideal reaction is it a reaction that anybody is saying is representative of women as a whole no I don't think that that's the case but does it ring true within the kind of 
boundaries of that fiction that Hooper and Verhoeven have established? Yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, it's a whole different kettle of fish to Showgirls. I wouldn't watch Showgirls and then go, oh, uh, now I'm going to check out L. That'll be similar. But you're no. right. There's an interesting relationship between those two films. Yeah, yeah, there is. Um, Paul Verhoeven, you know, often is accused of being whether it's you know a misogynistic I think basic instinct was um, accused of being quite homophobic wasn't it I think there were sort of protests uh, about it when it was first released and that kind of thing what's your response to all of those sort of accusations at Paul Verhoeven as a filmmaker yeah I think he sort of doesn't give a fuck and that um, (laughs) (laughs) that will always result in some interesting stuff I mean I guess it goes back to what I was saying about Fatal Attraction like films are always documents of their time and that and it's sort of sometimes more interesting that a filmmaker will document what's going on in society through their fiction than try to document an idealized society that we ought to be working towards but yeah Verhoeven I mean like look at stuff like Starship Troopers, I think that was widely misunderstood as a sort of fascist endorsement of the military. But Verhoeven is a Dutch guy looking in on the outside of American society. And I think it's an indictment of American militarism. It it films it in a way that America would want to be filmed, like it's very sexy and they all look very macho. Mm. But how you can come out of that film and not think that it's taking the piss, I think it's just... Like, just stupid. Those, um, the... Uh, sort of mock military recruitment documentaries in Starship Troopers. So much fun. And then the gore, it just really goes for it. It's like, it's incredible that he was given that kind of budget to make sort of such an explicit and, um, you know, fairly sexually explicit as well. Like, I don't imagine now that you would have a movie that's about bugs going to war on the earth or vice versa that would also just like take the time to sort of show us everybody showering together in co-ed showers and then banging yeah. like <laughs> yeah. it feels like it's from another another world compared to yeah, yeah a, a sort of action movie that's shot at like 12 certificate now very much a, a different time wasn't it yeah I agree um, and I suppose now you know you look at Paul Verhoeven's films now like Elle and it's, it, it's much more in that sort of less mainstream more art housey circuit right uh, the, you know that, that films like that aren't going to get seen in an Odeon or whatever in the same way that Starship Troopers would have done you know so it's, it's that, that that's the sort of difference now, I think, isn't it? Yeah, you're not going to get the budget for those uh, sexy blockbusters. No, exactly. Um, he's so funny, isn't he? he? And you're right, he d- does not give a fuck. When I, I filmed an interview with him once with Danny Lee for the BBC and he absolutely, uh, he got he went off on one for about 15 minutes about how angry he was that sex scenes in uh, in this day and age, women keep their bras on too much. And he was like, I, I watch movies and I see sex scenes and the woman is wearing the bra. Take the bra <laughs> off and all this. And he was so upset by that. Um, basically, again, sort of lamenting the, the, the explicit sex scene in movies essentially yeah so what happened after showgirls then so we move into the late 90s what happened to the erotic thriller post showgirls well i think it had lost that fundamental logic of these things cost you know 14 million to make and then they make 300 million so again it's it's sort of an industry thing showgirls cost i think 45 50 million and then didn't even make that back Mm -hmm. So it's a bit of a reset um, and you do still find these movies, but they're generally made with um, teenagers or people playing teenagers and TV stars. So they cost a lot less and they become, you know, less of a sort of a prestige night out and, and more of like that thing that you were saying, like something you find on cable TV late at night when you're channel surfing. Yeah, it's so right. Yeah, I mean, the teen stuff, again, this is a really interesting point that you made in your essay that the at the sort of mid 90s point just as these movies came to an end we had the beginning of this new wave of slightly more risque teen movies right uh the one that always springs to mind for me a big favorite of mine growing up was uh, cruel intentions from 1998 she's quite cute you know young supple breasts a tight Be her captain, Picard Felmont. Bold they go. Where no man has gone before. I can't. 
again, not really, not as explicit as those films, but it kind of feels like almost a bit of a sort of natural progression on from some of those movies. Because obviously it's like, it's taking the Dangerous Liaison story, but it's making it a lot more kind of glossy and teeny, isn't it, I suppose? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Like, take some of the hottest teen stars of the time, Ryan Philippe, Sarah Michelle Gellar, uh, Selma Blair and Reese Witherspoon, have them connive and scheme against one another, throwing Christine Baranski as the kind of camp comic relief. Um, yeah. <laughs> and the dialogue is quite fruity, so it, you almost remember it as a sort of more explicit film than it is. I mean, you do see Ryan Philippe's bum, but it's not in a sort of fully sexual context. He's just climbing out of the pool. Um, yeah. I mean... He's he's done this very much on purpose to lure Reese Witherspoon, but she's sort of not initially that impressed at that point in the film. And then there's yeah, there's, so there are so, there is sexy stuff going on in Cruel Intentions, but it's much more about the dialogue. It's it's Sarah Michelle Gellar saying you can stick it anywhere, uh, as yeah. so memorably parodied later in Not Another Teen Movie, um, <laughs> which you know as soon as once once you get a scary movie on or Not Another Teen Movie or an epic movie made about your genre, that's the point at which it's sort of maybe time to wind things up because you've mm-hmm. become parodiable that's the nail in the coffin isn't it and of course there were quite a few for the early ones too right so, um fatal is it fatal instinct is that the one that's like the fatal sort of instinct spoof? yeah 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 so there's a lot that yeah and you're right you know it's like that's the moment isn't it where it's kind of that's it's time to wind down uh Another notable film from this era and another another favourite of mine, this is going to make me sound like such a perv, is Wild Things, right? W- Wild Things starring Nev Campbell, Denise Richards, Kevin Bacon and Matt Dillon. He started rubbing my shoulders. Accusations can destroy. I'm innocent. You guys do sex crimes, right? When was this that Sam Lombardo gave you the ride? Did Sam Lombardo rape you? Yeah, okay, he did. He pushed me to the floor. And appearances can deceive. Kelly said that we should do this to hurt Mr. Lombardo. She found out that Mr. Lombardo was in love with her mom, and that was it. So you stay here! You know how my mom's pain... I mean, Wild Things is this hilarious camp thriller. There's loads of murder and deceit, but also it is such a sleazy film, right? It almost feels like it doesn't belong in the late 90s. feels like it belongs 10 years earlier. Yeah, there's a slow motion shot of Denise Richards climbing out of the pool in this... um obscenely thin swimsuit with the water like dripping off her and the hair yeah. everywhere. oh my goodness just yeah I, it feels more Incredible. explicit than it is but yeah what a what a ridiculous film i accidentally stole this film from a friend and fellow critic sophie monks calfman because it turned out her amazon was logged on on my telly and she was on twitter going i've got some sort of stalker or hacker and they've been watching like all wild things and films like this <laughs> I had to put my hand up and say, yeah, sorry, I am the person who is still watching Wild Things in 2020. (laughs) I love it. And actually, Matt Dillon kind of ticks that Michael Douglas box a bit, doesn't he? Of kind of sleazy. And and I suppose Kevin Bacon a little bit in that film too. Those kind of not particularly likeable, but quite charismatic, but quite awful and sleazy at the same time, you know? Completely. You're so right. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah, um, Matt Dillon. I mean, what an interesting actor he is. Yeah. Stuff like Factotum and The House That Jack Built and Wild Things and There's Something About Mary. How do those mm. all belong on the same CV? Like, <laughs> wonderful. I'm glad that they do. Exactly. I love it. And actually, even speaking of There's Something About Mary, right, I think that's an interesting point that you know each of these films that we've talked about the horror has been less and less and less right i mean you know fatal attraction has those real kind of horror set pieces now movies that have kind of explicit sex have moved much more into comedies right and of course we had a lot of sex teen comedies in the late 90s um from like you mentioned there's something about mary but also the american pie films etc it felt like that was the place where you got your sex in mainstream cinema yeah totally it's that thing of like with the with the erotic thrillers so-called you would you could say oh yeah no i'm here for the thriller and the drama and and oh there's some sex too well how about that and then yeah teen sex comedy is the same thing like i'm here for the comedy i'm here for the lols oh there's a you know a whole big scene of like shannon elizabeth walking around with no pants on i had no idea i'm shocked shocked to discover 
this it's kind really, of going on. I know, it's so true. And actually, you know, that there are already by the late 90s, everything was so much less explicit. I mean, even when you, we've talked about on the podcast before about slasher movies, the, the early 80s slasher movies were really about kind of how much can we push the gore and the practical effects. And it was almost like, even looking at the artwork, it was like people with knives going through their skulls or whatever, you know, with sort of video nasties. The covers themselves were even sort of uh, taboo. Whereas yeah, you look at the shit 90s, like the mutilator, just incredible. Yeah, <laughs> driller killer and stuff. And then you look at the 90s slashers and it's just a series of famous faces, right? It's like, oh, look, Drew Barrymore, Nev Campbell, Jennifer Love Hewitt, whatever. And and even the, the scenes themselves, the kill scenes, they're not focusing on the violence and the blood. They're focusing on the sort of the chase sequences and, the, and then often it will cut away before we we see much you know and it's like even even the actual horror had completely dialed down by the late 90s as well which is interesting yeah and then there's a sort of like that there's a dividend that is a result of that that when they do go hard it feels really brutal like the scene where the guy gets uh, stabbed through the ear in the toilet stall at the start of scream yeah. 2 like really horrible because you're not expecting that from scream necessarily yeah you're right actually and i guess screams are slightly more the exception aren't they and I wonder if that's because it's Wes Craven who is kind of you know this this filmmaker of the 70s and 80s kind of bringing his sensibility a bit more and you can feel that slight tension in the screen movies between Kevin Williamson's kind of Dawson's Creaky kind of vibe and then Wes Craven being like no I actually want to make a a really gory nasty horror film as well kind of thing I think that's what makes those films work so well yeah totally because it's not that sort of um I don't know, Final Destination 2 type thing of like, I don't care about these people really. They're sort of vapid and and boring and horrible. And and it becomes about like how inventively they're going to die. With Scream, they're they're kind of adorable, like characters that you like. And knowing that most of them are going to get killed off actually makes it really gripping. Yeah, agreed. Um, So then... What's kind of happened since? I mean, just briefly speaking over the last sort of decade or so, I mean, you touched upon this earlier about television. Is that, in your opinion, where the sort of high-end erotic thriller has gone? Has it moved away from cinema altogether? Yeah, I think so. I mean, there's this funny parallel with when Hollywood was panicking in the 50s because TV had come along and was sort of stealing its audiences and they responded by making these massive biblical epics in yes. cinemascope and you know disaster movies with huge practical stunts and that was all designed to sort of lure people away from the attractions of the small screen where you you couldn't get that kind of thing and now i mean movies are so much about these big tentpole releases i mean not this year i guess but uh Mm. conventionally throughout the 2010s it's all about your james bonds and your marvels and just like big stuff doing enormous things with a huge canvas and then Mm. movies and tv you know there's this kind of split so for um movies you're either a 15 million dollar movie or less or you're like a hundred million dollar movie or more and and the middle gets squeezed and and then what you see with tv is these high quality, high caliber pieces of storytelling that guess what also have a lot of sex and violence in them, which is a really potent combination and certainly one that I find really appealing. I mean, I love shows like Hannibal and I mean, the first half of Game of Thrones, say. Yeah, Game of Thrones. I wonder. I wonder how responsible Game of Thrones was for that whole movement in a way, because it, it was. It was almost when you first start watching Game of Thrones, shockingly explicit. I think in a in a good way. Yeah, totally. I mean, it's it was almost like an open goal that was sort of there for somebody to. I'm not up on my football mes- metaphors. Somebody to shoot into. <laughs> <laughs> is that a football metaphor or a sex metaphor? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, works as um, both. That's good. Yeah. But yeah, uh, wide open for somebody to kind of persuade some fairly high end legitimate stars to appear in their TV program and get their kit off. Because, I mean, people can see endless nudity in whatever combination they want and to whatever degree of explicitness takes their fancy online in porn. But there's still something about that being anchored to a story i think for a lot of audiences and for you know to know something about the character who's going through this stuff i think is still appealing yeah i agree and i guess it i guess hbo in general have been such a big part of this i mean even i suppose going back to things like uh, sex in the city and then six feet under and just the sort of kind of slightly more adult content that you just weren't seeing 
definitely not a, a, in TV before that, but also even in film. Yeah, and it's 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 been really interesting to sort of see how all that's progressed. And I don't want to oversimplify it because. Um... I mean, to be clear, I think we are, to a certain extent, talking about American TV here. True, European yeah. television, um, UK television. I mean, Lady Chatterley's Lover, I remember that with Sean Bean causing a stir when I was quite young. I wasn't allowed to watch it. But um, yeah, there's there's all, sort of always has been a bit of sex in telly, but I think mm. the Americans catching up to it has inevitably felt like it had a really huge impact. So... What's the future of the sort of high-end erotic thriller that we saw in the early 90s? Do you think that will ever return or was that its own little bubble that we'll sort of never see again? I just watched Obsessed with Idris Elba, Beyonce and Ali Lata. It is such a pleasure to meet you, Mrs. Charles. Hi. You said she was plain. That girl may be a lot of things, but she ain't plain. I wouldn't know. I only have eyes for you. A lot of these single gals see the workplace as their hunting ground. And I think this one has got you in her crosshairs. Kind of doing a retread of the fatal attraction dynamic. And that film kind of flubs it, I think, because, I mean, it's this very, very sort of Obama era thing that kind of tries to pretend we're all colorblind and that, like, the 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 racial dynamics of the film just sort of aren't there, which is really a, a missed opportunity. I, what I would sort of hope is that um, people can explore kind of current tensions through the premise of the erotic thriller, because the erotic thriller is a great way to explore, as we talked about with Fatal Attraction, like what's going on in people's homes, what's going on in people's work lives, um, what are those tensions around gender roles or around race or around rising economic inequality like can we have some of those things in the mix um but also with some high sheen production value glamour sex and stabbings like exactly. <laughs> i would love it if people could bring that back and um i think although it's a different kind of movie something like get out shows that there is an appetite for those kinds of social thrillers um mm. I just think it would be interesting to inject a bit of sex into that as well. I know. And I guess, you know, like you said from the very beginning, it is a, a business. And I think that it does feel like there's a reluctance these days to release a film that is a, you know, an NC-17 in America or an 18 here or whatever. It feels like we get less and less of them now for obvious reasons, I guess. They don't pull in as big an audience. Um, I remember when David Fincher's Gone Girl came out and uh, that, I suppose, in some ways has a few similarities, doesn't it, to the sort of erotic thriller. And there, there that that getting quite a lot of talk that it was a you know in the UK an 18 certificate movie that was actually you know making loads of money and like it made more money than any other 18 had in the last sort of 20 years or whatever and again I guess it comes down to that sort of thing you know if people can lower their certificate and make it more uh, accessible to a wide audience they're going to make more money from it but it is it does feel like a shame. I think something that might start to happen I don't think there's quite an appetite for it yet but given streamers access to sort of different territories and different data on audience viewing habits i think what we could start to see is things like recuts for different territories and recuts mm. for different ages so you could have like the nc17 version of something for america or for your know, americans who sign on without the parental guidance lock like this, we already see this with airplane movies where they'll cut out the sex. I think, but I think movies that are sort of made with that in mind from the get go may start to happen. That's my punt on a prediction for the future. It's different versions of films tailored to different levels of explicitness. Yeah. Well, there you go. Uh, we'll have to wait and see what happens, I suppose, especially post this year. Like, what the hell is going to happen to films? But let's wait and see. Uh, so, I'm going to ask you finally. Uh, if you were to recommend three, a kind of top three erotic thrillers, what would be your picks? Oh, well, I think Basic Instinct is kind of the uh, the trope setter. That's that's the one in terms of including like all of these elements that we've talked about: the A list yeah. stars, the A list nudity, the uh, ridiculous like surrealism almost of the sex and violence, um, and just being a hoot to watch. I mean. 
yes, take it with a sort of large spoonful of some of these attitudes may not have aged too well, but um, hopefully experience it as a document of that time rather mm. than um, something that by recommending it to you, I necessarily agree with. <laughs> yeah, good, good. Okay, basic instincts. That's it, yeah. Any others? So the last seduction, oh, yeah. as, as a genuine like quality watch, like seek that out, um, I would say the best performance in any of these films is Linda Florentino as Bridget Gregory. She's iconic, um, mm -hmm. overused word, but yeah, it's true in her case. And it's got a really nice plot on it. It's, if you like film noir, it's it's that kind of plot. Um, really twisty, turny, money, betrayal, deception, all of that. Nice, very cool. Um, and I would also recommend everyone give Showgirls a go because, I mean, come on. <laughs> yes. You've got to watch Showgirls at least once in your life, haven't you? <laughs> Rite of passage, absolutely. <laughs> Amazing. Catherine, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, I'm going to end with one final question that I always ask all my new guests. It's a difficult question, but what is your favourite horror film? Oh, uh, real soft spot for misery. Um, oh, yeah. Like the the horror scene is, is a banger. Once, once seen sort of, you know, always remembered the hobbling scene. Um, without you know too many spoilers but it's also about writing and isolation and it almost could be achieved as a stage play like that i think that's yeah. something that's really fascinating about it as well like it doesn't kind of make use of every trick and technique in the filmmaker's arsenal and yet it still achieves so much and it's a good you know, female villain um i really you know just kathy bates in that role <laughs> as Addie Wilkes the the nightmare nurse it's just yeah it's just stunning so good speaking of sort of riding the line between sort of menacing and camp right as well that performance is mm. so wonderful her just kind of like dancing around and snorting like a pig and then also her being so terrifying elsewhere in the film it's just perfect isn't it yeah so she's good. scary because she's so weird like she's yeah. not you know, some <laughs> dude with a knife she's just like really not all there that moment where he's like I think I'm in trouble here <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I love it. Amazing. Well, Catherine, thank you so much. Um, just remind us again, where can people find uh, more of your work out there? And tell us a little bit again about Guilt Free Pleasures. So Guilt Free Pleasures will be on BBC Four um, this autumn slash winter. We don't have a precise date yet, but please uh, look for it on iPlayer. Uh, it'll be alongside all of the other Inside Cinema shorts, which I highly recommend you check out. Mike produces and edits all of those and he does a bang up job of that. Ah, oh, thank you. Yeah, I would also heartily recommend that. Uh, Catherine Bray, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. And that's it for this week. Thank you so much for listening and a huge thank you to my brilliant guest, Catherine Bray. Such a treat to finally have her on the podcast. Uh, so please do get in touch. What do you think of this little subgenre of films, the erotic thriller? Do you have a particular fave from this era? Please do get in touch. The email address is evolutionofhorror at gmail.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and Letterboxd. And if you want to discuss this week's episode and anything horror related with fellow listeners, join the discussion group that's the evolution of horror discussion group and that can be found on facebook we also have a subreddit reddit.com slash evolution of horror you can find all previous episodes and seasons of this podcast on our website evolutionofhorror.com you can find this podcast on all major podcast platforms including itunes podbean stitcher acast libsyn and spotify please do drop us a little rating or review if you get a chance it would really help us get discovered by new listeners Okay, onwards to next week then, and we're going to be continuing the discussion of psychological thrillers. Next week, I'm going to be joined by Becky Dark to discuss two absolute classics from the 90s, The Silence of the Lambs from 1991 and David Fincher's Seven from 1995. Cannot wait. Join us next week for all of this and more on the evolution of horror. Horror.